Today we go to chapter 21. Caleb, if you will take us through and let's begin in verse number 1. Verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Amen. All right. Well, if you're going to take notes today, I want to divide this chapter up into just three simple points. And we're going to explore what uh, scholars call eternity. Now, we have made our way through all of the, all of the intriguing and sometimes head-scratching uh, sometimes you have to really seek the Lord to, to find the right interpretation. We've made our way. We've unraveled much of the book of Revelation. But friends, we're coming to the grand finale. We've made it through the seven-year tribulation period. We've made it through the battle of Armageddon. We've made it through the second coming of Christ. We've come through the millennial reign and the great white throne judgment. And now what is next on God's agenda? It is called eternity. Scholars call it the final state. See, in my thinking before I really began to study Revelation some years ago, in my thinking, I thought the battle of Armageddon happened, Christ returned, and then boom, it was just eternity from then on out. I was stunned when I realized God has a much larger agenda. So throughout the entire millennial reign, which we studied last week, and then comes the great white throne judgment where sinners of all ages, including our own, will be thrown into the lake of fire. Death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. As we studied these incredible truths, now after the thousand year reign and now after the final judgment, now comes what we call eternity, the final state. And the Bible is going to tell us a great deal about it. I'm going to break today into three simple points. Number one, the condition of eternity. What will it be like? What can we expect? What does God want us to know on this side of eternity? Number two, I want to talk about the citizens of eternity. Who is going to be granted to enter into God's city? And who is going to be left out? The Bible tells us who is left out. And then lastly today, I want to talk about the capital city, the new Jerusalem. What does the Bible say about it? So, uh, again, verse number one, I want you to be sensitive to the phrase. Remember we said last week that John says the phrase, then I saw over 30 times in the book of Revelation. Now, why is that important? Because what that speaks of is a sequence of events. So people who tried to to put this event over here and move this event thousands of years up or thousands of years behind. I don't think you can do that. Because what John the Revelator is seeing, he's seeing a sequence of events. So you go back to chapter 19. What does he say? Then I saw heaven open and Christ return. Revelation 19, 11. Then what's next? Then I saw, chapter 20, verse 1, the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign. Then I saw, what's next? Revelation 20, verse 11, the great white throne judgment. And now, chapter 21, verse 1, then I saw eternity, the final state. 
What's my point? The point is that there is a clear sequence to events. There is an unfolding of all of these events. And I don't think it's wise to try to get them out of order. My personal view, I believe Revelation is in perfect chronological order. Now, verse number one, we have a dilemma. And I'll let you decide how you view this. So verse number one says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So what does that mean? Scholars believe one of two things. And, and it's very difficult, I think, to interpret. They believe one of two things. Number one, they believe that God is going to utterly destroy the universe. I mean, it's just going to be destroyed. And God's going to start all over and create a new heavens and a new earth. For the first one, the one that we know today is going to pass away, the Bible says. Or second, they believe that God's going to basically renovate the earth. I can see both points in Scripture. Matter of fact, Caleb, take me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. I can see both, and I have questions about both. So I'll tell you my honest answer. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. If God is going to utterly destroy the universe and then recreate it, then my question that I've, I've personally not he heard anyone ask, let alone answer, is where are we when that happens? If we're on the earth during the millennial kingdom, then where are we going to be if the heavens are destroyed and the earth is destroyed? I don't, I don't understand that. So some scholars think that the word new in Revelation 21 verse 1 literally means to renovate. It's, it's like what Paul said in Colossians. Even though the outward man is wasting away day by day, the inward man is being what? Renewed every day. What's that word renewed? It literally means renovated. So in eternity, what are you going to be like in eternity? Well, the Bible says that we'll be known even as we are known. We'll have a glorified body, but I think you are going to be you. I am going to be me. I'll have my same sense of humor, which is probably a little poor. But I'll have, uh, you'll have your personality. Your spirit will be the same. Your body will be glorified. But you, who you really are, your soul, your spirit, who you really are, that's going to stay the same. But you will be renovated. Is that what it means in verse 1? The new heavens and the new earth, that is going to be renovated? Or is it going to be utterly destroyed and completely redone? We don't know. But here is what we know. The condition is going to be that it is brand new. Now, there are many scriptures laced throughout the Bible that talks about the end of the world as we know it, the universe, what God has created. But Caleb, read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And let's pay attention to this. It says, But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come <coughs> like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the day, the com I'm sorry, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Amen. So here is my point. 
whether the earth and the universe is going to be utterly destroyed or whether it's going to be completely renovated and made new. Either way, here's what the Bible says, and here's what we know. It's going to dissolve. So here is the point. The point is not who's right, who's wrong. The point is Peter says, if this universe, if this world as we know it is going to pass away, then what manner of people ought we to be? Should we not be people of godliness? People of holiness? Should we not live for another world? Should our priorities not be that of eternity? <coughs> because I assure you this. The things that you gain, the wealth that you gain, no matter how much you love your home, no matter, how much you, no matter what kind of assets you have in life, no matter what your toys are, those things that you love, they're going to dissolve. What you and I ought to live for is eternity. Amen. Amen. Why? Because one day, if you're born again, you and I are going to live in a place where righteousness dwells. Why? Because here's condition number one, if you're going to take notes. Number one. Because it's going to be where God dwells. Caleb, take us on through Revelation 21. Verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. So number one, what is the great condition of eternity? It's going to be brand new because it's where God is going to dwell with us. And because God is going to dwell there... Let me tell you what's going to happen. The Bible says there's going to be no more crying. There's going to be no more mourning, no more sorrow. There's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more death. All of these things are going to be the former things of our life. And as the Bible says, he's going to make all things new. Friends, do you know the weightiness of what that says? <coughs> Let me put it into this kind of context. You know what this scripture is telling us? You want to know what eternity is going to be like with God? You want to know what heaven is really going to be like? There are going to be no missing children there. There are going to be no child abuse and no child neglect. There's going to be no divorce courts there. Amen? There's going to be no emergency rooms, no automobile accidents. There's going to be no more rape and no violence. There's going to be no more racism and no more prejudice. There's going to be no more theft. There's no, not going to be any murder. There's not any strained relationships. There's not any bankruptcy courts. Friends, it is going to be a place where God Almighty reigns. And because of that, righteousness is going to dwell because it's going to be a place that is brand new. And the former things of our life, like disease and pain and loss and crying and death and sorrow, let me tell you, those things are going to be distant memories. Amen. Amen. And he's going to wipe away every tear out of our eyes. What a place it's going to be. Continue, Caleb. Verse 7. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Okay. So let's talk for a moment about the citizens of heaven. And by the way, let me mention this. This chapter is sometimes called the chapter of the blessed no mores. Here's a good little homework assignment. Why don't you, at some point this week, go through all of chapter 21 and try to locate how many no mores there are going to be. There's going to be no sun. <laughs> There's going to be no moon. 
Because the glory of God is going to light the place. The, sh- the gates will never shut. There's going to be no more death. There's going to be no more evil or wickedness. I'm telling you, just go through the whole chapter and just pinpoint everywhere that there are no mores in this chapter. It's called the blessed, it's called the chapter of the blessed no mores. Friends, that's going to be the condition of the new heavens and the new earth. But number two, who are the citizens? Well, So I love what scripture says here. God is going to dwell with us. We'll be his people and he will be our God. Well, here's what I love about earlier in the book. If you go back to our study of the seven churches of Revelation, remember that who Christ spoke to, not only did he speak to the church age, but he spoke to the individual. Even in Laodicea, now if you remember, Christ had nothing good to say to the Laodicean church. He had no words of affirmation or commendation. And I believe with my whole heart that I believe we are living in the age of Laodicea. Where we right now are in that last church age. But do you remember what Jesus said to each of the churches? He would say, but to the one who conquers. To the one who overcomes sin. I'm so thankful, even in an age like ours, let me tell you, this whole age can be hypocritical, but that doesn't mean you have to be. This whole age can go through deception, but that doesn't mean you have to be deceived. This whole age can have rampant sin, but that doesn't mean you have to. To the one who conquers, the Bible says, let me tell you, I want to be among those numbers. I want to be among the ranks of God. I want to be one of the saints. I want to be one of the ones that I have washed my robes in the blood of the Lamb. And whatever this society does, whatever this culture does, whatever this church age does, I want to be one that overcomes sin and that I am welcomed in that city of God. Who are the citizens? The ones who conquered sin Through the blood of Jesus. Now, who's going to be left out? It's interesting in verse 8, the Bible tells us eight types of people who are going to be left out. Now, as we read this, it's very important for you to understand. This eight, that listing of eight that it gives us, these are not isolated incidents of sin. Okay? If that were the case, all of us would be without hope. What this is speaking to are habitual, practicing, lifestyle types of sins. A few weeks ago, a lady wrote in to me and asked, I'm a little confused. She said, can you clarify this? She said, I don't understand if Jesus will forgive our sin, then what what about if I continue the exact same sin over and over and over? Can I just continuously ask forgiveness of the same sin and be guaranteed forgiveness? <coughs> First John answers that question for us. First John tells us, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? But also, First John teaches us, if we practice sin, what's the word practice there mean? It literally means habitual. If I continue a pattern of sin, if I continue in a lifestyle of this sin, if it is part of my routine, if it's part of my lifestyle, part of my rhythm, if it's what I'm embracing and choosing, then John says it very clearly, then we are deceived. You understand? If we're authentic and we genuinely repent. And by the way, the word repent does not mean to feel sorry. That's remorse. Repent means to turn from. And if you have not turned from your sin, then my friend, you've never repented of that sin. You must turn from it. You may feel bad about it. You may feel guilty about it. You may feel some remorse about it. But my friend, you must turn and walk away and begin to follow Jesus. That is 
repentance. So these are not isolated sins. These are lifestyles of sins. And he names eight. Let's pay attention to all eight. Caleb, take me through them one by one. But as for the cowardly. Okay, what does that mean? The cowardly. Friends, these are people who are ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are people that are ashamed of their faith. Have you ever met, you know what I call them? Chameleon Christians. You ever seen a chameleon Christian? They can blend in anywhere. If they're at church, they blend right in. And if they're out in the world, they blend right in. If they're among sinners, they blend right in. And if they're with the saints, they blend right in. The cowardly. Friends, let me tell you something. You should not, you should not be comfortable in sinful atmospheres. You realize that? If you're comfortable in sinful atmospheres, you may be a chameleon. It is quiet as a mouse. (laughs) Amen, Chad. I'll preach to myself. I'll amen myself. Can you just blend in? Wherever you are, you just blend. No. The cowardly. Those who do not stand for Christ. Those who, they just, they just blend. They just blend. They just blend. No. Next. The faithless. The faithless. Let me tell you, Jesus said when he comes to the earth, Luke chapter 18, you know who he's looking for? People of faith. People of faith. Next. The detestable. This means corrupt, polluted. Those who have polluted lives. Oh, my friends. Do you come in here and sing the songs of heaven, but then at home is your life polluted? Friends, don't be deceived. You will not enter the city with polluted lives. Next, please. Murderers. Murderer. Now, can someone who commits murder, can they receive forgiveness by the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. King David's a great example. <coughs> Some years ago, I led a murderer to, the, to salvation in, in Cairo, Egypt. Sat with him in his prison cell and led him to the Lord. Murderers can receive Jesus. But let me tell you, this does, does not mean physical murder. What did Jesus say? You have hatred in your heart, it's murder. You have lust in your heart. It's sexual immorality. It's adultery. Is that not next, Caleb? Read it for me. The sexually immoral. The sexually immoral will not enter the kingdom of God. Friends, I want you to hear my heart today. I want you to hear my pastoral heart. Is what you call sexual immorality what the Bible calls it? You need to see if it matches up. Because if the Bible calls it sexual immorality and you don't, guess who's in for a rude awakening when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ? We're living in a culture today that has no morality. None. None. And let me tell you, I don't care what culture says. I don't care what society says. Say amen if you're with me right now. I don't care what the laws of the United States of America say. God's standard of morality does not change. And the Supreme Court, let me tell you, it's above their pay grade. Congress, Senate, Supreme Court does not change God's law. And I wouldn't be on the wrong end of it if I were you. What's next? Sorcerers. Sorcerers. What's this mean? Divination. You check your horoscope every day. Friends, that's sorcery. You mess around with palm readings. You mess with tarot cards. Wiccans. Do you know what a stronghold Wiccans are in our region? And let me tell you, it's evil. It's wicked. 
and God will judge it. If you're under the sound of my voice today and you're dabbling in witchcraft and you're dabbling in Wiccan stuff, this pagan stuff, let me tell you, you're angering God Almighty and you'll stand in judgment. What's next? Idolaters. Idolaters, graven images, but let me tell you, that's not it. What idolatry means is anything that competes with the heart and the mind and wins out above God, that's idolatry. And Colossians says that greed can be idolatry in our lives. And don't tell me that Americans don't suffer from that, amen? I fight it and you fight it, right? Next. And all liars. What? <laughs> Wait, all... What would you say? All liars. Oh, you want the Greek word for all is? All. <laughs> so that means if you're really good at white lies, guess what category you're in? All. Let me tell you how the Bible defines lying. Deception. There are no loopholes here. Say, Chad... Why are you being so hard? Because, let me tell you, the Bible is hard. The Bible calls this thing a narrow path. And you know what the Bible says in Matthew 7? The way of the world, the way the Bible calls it, the way of destruction is wide and broad. And most are on that path. And the Bible says the way to life, the way to this new city, the way to eternity, the way to God is a narrow path. And the Bible says few there be that's on it. Which path are you on today? I preach hard because let me tell you, you don't know, like our precious sister Pat, you don't know when you're going to be called into eternity. And let me tell you, of everything I know about our beloved sister Pat Fry, of everything I, and I knew her well. We shared many, 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 many conversations and many praying. And let me tell you what I knew about Pat. I knew she was born again. And let me tell you, on the day that your number's called, and on the day that you'll stand before God Almighty, the most important thing about you will be where you're born again. That would be the most important And everything you've worked toward and everything you've worked for and everything you've spent your life on, you know what it says is going to happen? 2 Peter 3.10, it's going to dissolve. Are you right with God? Now, let me tell you what I like about this list. Has anybody ever lied? Raise your hand if you're a liar today. And if you don't, guess what? You're a liar. <clears throat> Anyone ever stolen anything? Oh, now I'm not a thief. Come on now. You ever taken something that wasn't yours? <clears throat> Let me tell you, if God holds me in account for all the books I've never returned to other people, oh, Lord Jesus. <coughs> <coughs> Pastors are notorious book thieves. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because, number one, I can't see you. But number two, are you an adulterer? Because if you've lusted after your heart, after someone in your heart, you're an adulterer. What's my point? My point is that apart from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ... Every one of us is in this list of eight. Every one of us. So my question today is what are you trusting in? Better question, who are you trusting in? Are you trusting in yourself? Are you saying I'm not that bad of a person? No, you're in this list. You're sexually immoral. You're a liar. You're cowardly. You're detestable. You're polluted and corrupted. You're in this list, and I'm in this list. And apart from Jesus, what hope do we have? 
And that's why if you are part of this list, let me tell you, those of us that we are, we better lean as hard as we can lean into the grace of God. We better trust every hour in the sufficiency of Jesus and not ourselves. Amen. So what is salvation? Those who are not born again, they're trusting in themselves. Those who are born again, they're trusting in the grace of God. Which are you trusting in today? You trusting in the Lord Jesus or are you trusting in your goodness, in your good living, in being a good person, in being right? Oh, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, I've not come for those who don't think they need a physician. I've come for those who are sick and they know they need help. Let me tell you, I need the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I can tell you where you can find me without him. You can find me in that list in verse 8. But no, because of Jesus, you know where now you can find me? My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Is yours? Let's, let's continue. And their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now we studied that last week. Remember we said everyone dies a physical death. That's when the soul detaches from the body and either goes to the Lord or goes to hell. The second death is when the soul is condemned to the lake of fire. Now, someone asked me this week, and and, and let me bring great clarification here. The lake of fire, someone asked me, does that mean that you're tormented in hell, but when... Hell is going to be thrown into the lake of fire, according to chapter 20. Does that mean that you'll just be annihilated? No. Friends, I want you to hear me now. Nowhere in the scriptures does the Bible teach annihilation for sinners. Some people believe that. But no. Here's what the Bible teaches. In the lake of fire, you will be tormented day and night. Forever and ever. Friends, that's eternity. And that's for people who are apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So, if you die, if you're, if you're unsaved, you'll die the physical death, the soul departing from the body. But then you'll die the second death, which is the soul being cast into the lake of fire. If you are born again, you'll die the physical death. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But you'll never die the second death. So here's how I like to say it. If you're born once, you'll die twice. If you're born twice, you only die once. You must be born again. Amen. Continue, please. Verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last seven plagues. Now, isn't that interesting? Remember what we said Throughout our study, 60 times in Revelation we are introduced to angels. Isn't that something? By the way, Lord willing, unless the Holy Spirit were to change course, the whole month of December, I'm going to teach on angels. I don't know what I'm going to call it yet. But the whole month is going to be on angels, and I can't wait. 60 times we're introduced to angels in the book of Revelation. Now, this angel was part of pouring out the seven plagues upon the earth. Isn't that interesting? Now... He is going to have, John is going to have a remarkable tour guide. Have you ever done interesting tours before? You know, now that I'm completely blind, sometimes I think, God, you allowed me to live what feels like multiple lifetimes. I've done some great tours in my life. I've been able to tour many, many places, many, many cities. The Lord's allowed me to travel through 40 countries. And I've seen so many wonderful things. I've had a tour guide through, through the Coochie Tunnels of Vietnam, which was utterly fascinating. I've had tour guides through the pyramids of Egypt and the Egyptian Museum, through the Alexandrian Library. I've had many tour guides. And what does a tour guide do? It explains what you're seeing, right? 
How many of you have been to Biltmore and had the little audio tour guide? That's nice. You can rewind. <laughs> John is going to have this angelic tour guide. And let's pay attention to what he tells us that we're seeing. I think it's incredibly fascinating. So what have we talked about? The conditions of eternity, all the no mores. There's no more sun, no more moon, no more gates shut, uh, no more crying, no more death, no more evil, no more sea. Oh, I forgot that. Why is there not going to be oceans in this new heavens and new earth? You know, right now the earth is three-fourths water. 79% of the earth is covered by water. Why will it not be in the new heavens and the new earth? Scholars think because what do oceans do? They separate mankind. God's going to bring it all back together. Amen? Let's now see the capital city, the new Jerusalem. Remember, we've said through our study, especially when we studied Babylon, the Bible is a tale of two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon. When Babylon falls in chapters 17 and 18... We rejoice in heaven in the beginning part of chapter 19. It is a major, major deal. And I just don't think until we get to heaven and we really understand the weightiness and the, and, and the, the, the gravity of Babylon forever falling because what is coming next? The new Jerusalem. And what is the new Jerusalem? It is going to be God's eternal capital City, and the significance is profound. Don't let me forget to tell you about the Holy of Holies. Go ahead, Caleb. Take us through it. And he spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, mm. its radiance like a most rare jewel. Amen like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of so the Lamb. <coughs> so let's pause right here. If you're going to take notes... Note a few things right here. It's very interesting that the 12 sons of Jacob, of Israel, are inscribed on the gates. Because if you know anything about the 12 sons of Jacob, you know they were wicked men. Read about Judah in Genesis 38. It would make your mouth drop. Reuben and his great sin. Dan and his great sin. I mean, Jacob, these were the brothers of Joseph. They sold Joseph into slavery for crying out loud and then lied to their aged father. They were wicked men. Why would God inscribe their names? You know why? Because it is a forever testimony that God forgives sin. It speaks of the old covenant. It speaks of the Old Testament saints. Then we come to the foundations of the city. <coughs> Twelve foundations. Speaks of its permanence. Speaks that it is eternal. And what's inscribed on that? All of the apostles. The ones who fled. The ones who ran. The ones who cowered away. Remember when Jesus appeared through the locked door and walls? And what were the disciples doing? They were hiding in fear. Huh. Jesus said, peace. And then Jesus says, the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And then he filled them with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And they turned the world upside down. So the 12 gates with the 12 sons of Israel speaks of the Old Testament saints. The 12 apostles speaks of the New Testament, of the New Testament saints. Friends, you know what it's saying? This is a city for all. All of the people of God, both Old Covenant and New Covenant. Continue, please. Verse 15. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. 
The city lies four square, its length <clears throat> the same as its width, and he measured the city with this rod. Okay, let's pause right there. Its length was the same as the width. Now, this is important to note. Take notes on this if, if you're a note taker. In Moses' tabernacle, the Holy of Holies was a perfect cube, 15 feet on each wall. In Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies was a perfect cube, 30 feet on each wall. What is the new Jerusalem? Friends, you know what it is? It is a mammoth and an eternal holy of holies. It is, in our measurement today, this is 1,500 miles. To give us a picture of this, think, think with me. Take a line from Miami and South Florida and draw a line north to Maine. Then draw a line from Maine westward to Minneapolis. Then draw a line south down to Houston. And then draw a line from Houston back over to Miami. And that's the capital city. And friends, that's just the ground floor. This thing is 1,500 miles equal. But listen, it's 1,500 miles high into the stratosphere. What is this? This is a mammoth, eternal, holy of holies. And why is it going to be the eternal holy of holies? Because God himself is going to dwell there. Amen? Friends, we can't even fathom something like this. Do you know what this is? <laughs> Do you know what it is? When Paul went to the third heavens, this is where he went. And you know what Paul wrote? Paul said, it's not entered into the mind of man, the imagination, or the heart of man. What God has prepared for those who love him. Do you know what this is? It's John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, friends. This is what Jesus was talking about. Do you know what this is? It's Hebrews 10, 11. Abraham, who sought a city, a country, whose builder and maker is God. This is the new Jerusalem. And it's going to be our forever ever and permanent home. And you know how big it is? It's big enough to hold all of God's people of every century, of every age of the earth. Amen? Continue on, please. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement. So that would be in ours. 216 feet wide, 1,500 miles high. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, so, like clear glass. Clear glass. So scholars believe this jasper would have been like a clear stone. It, scholars describe it this way, shimmering ice. That's what the walls will look like, shimmering ice. Continue. Continue. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jaseth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates were made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold. Okay, two things I want you to note right here. Why a single pearl? Now, these are not clusters of pearls. This is one gigantic pearl. Each of them, 12 gates, each a single pearl. See, pearl was not kosher. It's not of the Jewish culture here. Pearl was, this is a Gentile thing. You know why? 
Because what did Jesus call his blood-bought church? The pearl of great price. Friends, this speaks of the church in this great city. Amen. Amen. Did you notice Peter? Which gate Peter's at? No, because Peter's not at any gate. All right? So there you go. (laughs) And, And what are the roads? Pure gold. You know, some, some preachers who don't take the Bible literal, they, they say, oh, it's an allegory. No, friends, if the Bible says it's pure gold, it's pure gold. What a small thing for the creator of the universe. You know, I read one time about a man, he was the ultimate loophole guy, and he died. And, you know, you can't take anything with you. The Bible says naked you came into the world and naked you'll leave the world. You can't take any of your stuff with you. But this guy, somehow, through a loophole, he ended up taking all of his gold. And he walks up to the pearly white gates and St. Peter's sitting there. Again, he's not, but just follow my joke. St. Peter's there and the man walks up with a wheelbarrow full of gold. And Peter looks at the guy and says, how come you brought pavement with you? (laughs) what have we said what's one reason why the streets are pure gold what's one reason because the thing of most value down here is of the least value up there it's just pavement